How's it going? Today I'm going to talk a little bit about Motex Dash Manager and uh, setting up some CAN, CAN bus uh, templates and whatnot. Because uh, I do get a lot of questions about this and, you know, just figure I would make a video versus answer them all independently. Um, I'm using C125 Dash Manager as an example. It doesn't matter which Dash Manager you use, as long as it's a C series Dash, uh, all of the information is going to apply. Uh, if you're using a older CDL or ADL Dash, uh, it will apply for the most part. There's a couple things that do not apply, like uh, the bit shifting um, and then the uh, output format size. But I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, for connections, cans. I'm just going to go ahead and start off with uh, the CAN bus uh, error counts. Uh, if I'm, I will log these no matter what. I, I really don't care if there's anything on the network or not. Um, it's just going to be good if there's ever anything added in the future. You, it's already there. You're logging it. You're good. Um, CAN bus utilization. I'll pay attention to a little bit if it's getting if it's exceeding like 75%. It's going to get me a little worried a little bit on. Uh, you know, how the data is, uh, you know, kind of transporting. Uh, if I see any transmit or receive errors, that means I need to probably check the wiring or termination, or uh, I have a bad, I have a bad node or device that's uh, getting, getting a little crazy. Um, so it, 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 and it does happen at times. It's not common. Most of the times it's wiring, but it is something that uh, you want to, you want to log and pay attention to. All right, moving forward, uh, we'll move into the communications. Um, you have the ability of you know, this is the one this is the 120 series dash so you have two can networks uh you can choose uh between can and j1939 i'm not gonna get into j 1939 for this video most users are not going to use j1939 you're going to be using can if you're watching this video of 99 percent um your bit rates you have the ability to choose between you know like 33 all the way to one megabit most of your motorsport stuff's one megabit most of your oe stuff is 500 250 and 125k um, it just really depends on the, uh, device. There is some devices out there like Mercedes interior bus, I think it's 83 K. So, you know, you do, you do have those out there. Um, we'll go into, uh, just the select menu. So you can select anything that they have offered or you've built before, right? So if you have, um, if you have data available and you're like, Hey, let's, uh, you know, let's, you know, I have a, let's say a link ECU, right? So you can, you can just click the link key so you can, you're good. It's logging things that it already has provided. Uh, I didn't write this one, so I don't know what it's got going on, um, but it's, it's there. If you want to edit it and you just click edit, it's a receive message. So we'll look at, um, it's, it's fixed binary. It shows that it's in word swap. Um, what word swap is, is that is, uh, you have two options on alignment, right? You have normal and you have word swap. Normal is big Indian, word swap is little Indian. If you don't know what that means, it basically means what area the byte overflow goes to. So if you have a signal, let's assume it's in the middle of the data packet, it's not on either end per se, just to, to clear things up. And it's uh it's two bytes long, right? And you're on the start, you're on the starting byte. It's gonna go, it's gonna move an increment like a normal number. It's gonna go from the right to the left as it increases in size. But once it hits the 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 end of that byte, right? Where does it overflow to to the next byte? Does it go to the left or does it go and jump all the way over and go to the right? Little Indian's gonna jump all the way over and start all the way on the right. Big Indian is gonna just keep progressing to the left and go to the next byte over to the left. So it's just kind of a smooth scale as you'd say. Um, the uh, receive timeout value, uh, I try to put that at three to four times the message transmit speed or the transmit frequency. So uh, depending on how how frequent the message is and, and how high it is on the uh, bus, because any device with a high arbitration ID and a high frequency on transmission does have the ability to get delayed a little bit. So it is something to keep in mind, but typically three to four times what the typical transmit speed is. So if I'm seeing something that's coming, uh, you know, once a second, I'll put it at three seconds. If I see something that's coming 100 times a second, I'll put it at 300 milliseconds and just basically three tenths of a second. Uh, that's kind of my de facto standard. Uh, default value on timeout, you can, you can either check to receive the default value or you can leave it as the last known value depending on what you're doing. 
Um, so this is good for uh, situations where you have a message that's just going to transmit information when it sees a change, right? And I'll use a Great Hill keypad as a good example. Uh, the Great Hill keypads, when you press a button on them, that's going to transmit a one for whatever button you pressed. And when you let off of that button, it's going to transmit a zero, right? So if you wanted to just like hold a button down, you want the default value on timeout to just retain whatever button you're pressing. You know, you don't want it to be a situation where you go, oh, okay, uh, well, it's been three seconds and he's still holding the button. I, I want to, you know, no, you want to just, you want to just retain that information. Um, if you do have the default value on timeout, which becomes a big benefit for devices, if you expect the frequency to come all the time, right? You know, if something's transmitting at a con consistent time base, uh, it becomes a good way to manage if you have a communications issue associated with that device. And I'll use the ECU as a good example. So like, uh, let's say you have engine speed, right? Engine speed typically is not a negative value. And if it is, you got a lot more questions to answer about that car. But if it's, if, if you see a value of negative one on your engine speed, that's gonna, you're gonna have to say what's something's going on, right? Well, what I'll do is I'll set my default value to like negative one for that message, right? And so if I see a negative one for engine speed, that tells me that I haven't received that can message before the timeout value ex ex was exceeded. So I'm having either, I have a conflict or I have a noisy node that's overriding everything else on the network. I have something going on that's preventing either preventing communications for that message to get to the dash or it's disconnected, one of the two. Um, for addressing format standards, 11 bit extended 29 bit. I'm not going to get into too much detail there. Most everything that I see in the OE world is standard. Every now and then I'll see some extended, um, allow fast receive, uh, at devices transmit rate allows you to, the ability to log at 500 Hertz. That's really the, 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 the true just answer there. If you have something that's a uh, high speed or high speed, high frequency data, for instance, we'll use IMU as a good example. Uh, you can allow fast receive if it's if it's uh, if it's logging, you can log it at 500 hertz. Versus if it allow fast receive isn't checked, you are only allowed to log it 200 hertz. We'll go into the receive channels a little bit, and we'll talk about these. This is a uh, receive message block. It appears so. It what what it does is this is offset zero. It's basically the it's looking at the first two bytes to see if what value they are. Um, because your offset, your offset is zero, so it's looking in the data packet. The identifier is zero, so it's looking for nothing but zeros, so to speak, or a value of zero for the identifier. And the identifier mask is looking every, at every part of that identifier to determine if the value is zero. So if, if, that, if that matches, then we can come over here, and this is what we get. So the offset over here... Um, our default value is zero RPM. So if I wanted to play my error handling ways, I would set it up as like per se negative one, right? The offsets two and what the offset means here, and it also um, over here for the most part, it's how many times we hop over a byte before we start looking at data, right? So if our offsets two, we're gonna hop over the first two bytes and then we start looking at the length of two bytes for our data. The output length, you can leave an auto in most circumstances unless you're doing something pretty crazy. And I'll get into it in just a second on the output link. Uh, our bit mask here is essentially of the two bytes of data, are we looking at all of the data or are we masking a portion of the data to get our answer or information? And for instance, if I do FFFE, we have cut the, the rightmost bit off. We've cut essentially the least significant bit uh, off in most circumstances. Um, and the data, you can click data shifted by right to the right by one bit to get that value back to where you're scaling your base resolution based on the least significant bit that you are using, not the ones that are masked as well. Uh, what else? What else do we got? Signed and unsigned. Um, signed is a, a value there. Also, if you have little Indian values, right? Um, word swap values. Your bit mask is always looked at in big Indian. So for instance, if you had data that you needed to, and you're only looking at a portion of the message, the value to the right here, 
is the least significant byte. And the value to the left here is your most significant byte, regardless on if you're looking at data in Big Indian or Little Indian, normal or word swap. For calculations, it gets kind of confusing to some people, and this is why I'm making this video for the most part. You have a base resolution of 0.1 hertz, which basically means your raw value times 0.1 hertz times the multiplier divided by the divisor, and then you put in parentheses, or you put a plus sign, and then in parentheses, the adder times the base resolution. That will give you your resulting output. So for instance, if our, if our value was one, right, we have, we have a raw value of one coming over the, you know, a, a byte value of one coming over the network, right? It's going to be one times 0 0.1 hertz times a multiplier of one times the divisor of six in parentheses plus the adder of zero. That is how that works. I will be providing a spreadsheet to help everybody with this. It does get kind of confusing at times, but essentially you can use a DBC factor and offset to scale in things to get your information true to be. So you have your, you can type in your raw number. Your raw number is in decimal form. You can type in the base resolution, the multiplier, the divisor, and the adder, and see, and then you have a factor and an offset and see if your numbers add up. Jumping back into the output length, you have the options of auto two and four, right? Uh, the only time I've ever really had to change it uh, was for one really, really obscure reason. And it was where I was trying to be probably too precise with the wheel speed. The wheel speed would give me like a 0 0.036 kilometers uh, per hour per bit, right? So I was like, I want the whole 0 0.036 kilometers per hour. So what I did is I, you know, let's say select, we'll go to uh, new, we'll click a news channel. My decimal placement is I went to, uh, let's say, what is it? Um, speed, kilometers an hour. I put my decimal places like way out there, right? And so what I was doing was using the multiplier to bring it back all the way super far forward. Right. But the problem that exists is if our output length is, let's say, two, that means we have two bytes to work with. So um, in a, let's say it's not a signed value. That means like the maximum placeholder value is sixty five thousand five hundred and thirty five times this base resolution here. So realistically, it wouldn't even like my base resolution. If I use my output length is two, I would never be able to get to the point to where I hit one kilometer an hour using this using this scenario and so what i was having is i had my my base resolution was way too deep in the decimal points and my output length was scaled at two so i only got to 32 kilometers an hour before it would overrun and go back to back to the negative values so to speak so you could bring it up to four and now you have like a value of like four billion times the base resolution which would work it would work in this scenario it would probably work right here but that's, that's where the output length can be changed in order to get things done. If you have something that you're trying to do super precise and you have some really high, high multiplier, which your multipliers, um, I think 32767 is the maximum values for your multiplier divisor and offset. It's a signed, signed 16 bit value. So negative 32768 is your maximum value, 32767. And then if you try something crazier than that, it'll tell you that you're outside the window. So 4,000. We'll do 40,000. I'm going to click OK. It's going to say, hey, 40,000 is not a valid entry. See, and it's got to be somewhere between the signed 16-bit value of negative 32768 and 32767. Um, but we'll, we'll just go back to back to our normal. We'll actually just cancel all this. But that's, that's where I used uh, the factors there for uh, formatting the data uh, for the output link. We'll go back, we'll hit uh, cancel. We'll go back here. So this offset value here too, uh, it's gonna be looking at data unless you put in the number eight. When you put in the number eight, it actually looks at the arbitration ID. And from there, it says what the arbitration ID is and looks at the arbitration ID to determine if the message matches. 
This allows you to use like, you know, essentially, um, this is how the message blocks exist for, I think the MoTeC. Let's clear that out and let's go select. Let's find M1, M1 general. Yep. Let's hit edit. See if channels. Yep. So you see our base value here was 640. So our base address is 0640. And then we go to receive channels. Our offset's eight. So it's looking at the ID. So the ID is 0640. Our bit mask is FFFF. And then here's our data in, in, in the ID 640. Here's our data in ID 641. Here's our data in ID 642 and so forth. You have 16 identifiers you can play with and you have a total of 64 channels per communications setup available to you at any time. Also for diagnostic channels, I typically don't use these because I haven't found them to be much meritable benefit. And instead I typically look at the error counts um, for validating of information because the er error counts are gonna basically overlap a little bit on what the information is, unless you have like an expander or some, some MoTeC devices, you'll have a little bit more information to work with on the diagnostic channels for uh, enumeration issues. Uh, but for general CAN channels, you're just gonna have transmit and receive errors and things like that. So I typically just look at the, uh, the, the CAN bus error counts to determine my, uh, my answers there. Anyways, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Appreciate your time. Thank you for watching and y'all have a good one.